Wonderful. And let's let's check in and then set a purpose and then see what we can create together. My check in is that I'm excited and um, delighted by this conversation and have been looking forward to it since I woke up this morning. Mm. I'm also excited about what's going to happen and I came from a pretty exhausting weekend uh, with family which is always as family sometimes is exhausting. Yeah. Um, I am a uh, Really enjoying the way your daughter is hanging on you. Just there's something about exactly how she's doing it. Now it changed, but that this one that ah oh, just stay. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that conveys trust in a way that is so nice to observe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for far longer than since I woke up. Um, and I also have anxiety about not remembering exactly what my entry point into it was. And so like, ah, what's going to happen? <laughs> and all that is fine. And uh, we have one more person who has joined us. Uh, would you tell us who you are? You are area code 647. It's Leone. Ah, hello. Hi, Leonie. Hi. Would, you, would you check in? Sure. Um, I'm excited about having this conversation because it will um, help to bring me back into the spirit of being in Poland yeah. <laughs> and to connect with some of the, just the, the awesomeness and sense of spaciousness and opportunity that was there. Mm -hmm. So that's my check-in. Wow. Cool. All right, dear Sarah. All right, dear Mickey. So um, you have it written down. I already yeah. forgot, but you have written down the purpose. Yeah. Discussion of emotion words and nonviolent communication, relational language and neuroscience, avoidance and interdependence. Great. Mm -hmm. Do you have some thoughts to get us started? Sure. Ah, can count on <laughs> someone in this world. <laughs> oh, um, what I've this 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 my thoughts lately have been straying in, into needs as well. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've been working with is um, is the the research of a man named Yak Punksep, who was an Estonian who grew up in the United States and did his research here. His research was about mammals and how mammals have seven different circuits that life energy runs on. And some of them are emotion circuits, so here's our emotion words, but some of them are motivation circuits mm. that are not emotion circuits. So the seeking circuit, for example. That's neat. Yes. The seeking circuit is not an emotional circuit, and it has within it a capacity for predatory aggression, which in its purest form is hunting, but shows up in, um, in human interactions in ways that are not so pleasant. Uh, experiences like uh, contempt or, um, or the movement into bullying or, um, or the uh, a reactivity to a sense, a, a disgust reaction, a reactivity reaction to a sense that someone else is being weak. So there's this, this interesting thread through human relations that a, appears to be slightly devoid of a certain kind of emotion, of the richness of emotion that we think of with the, with the grief circuit, with the, with the anger circuit, with the... Um, with the fear circuit, that there are these, that, that there are kind of these swaths of emotion that connect us. And then that the seeking circuit in particular takes us out of relationship into objectification. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, this, is, this is the area that I've been 
just deeply kind of grappling with and interested in and working with. Um, so emotion words that sort of touch the seeking circuit would be words like curious. Or, and if you add warmth to curiosity, of course, it becomes warmer. Or interest. I feel interested, you know. There's a intrigued. This, this sense of, uh, of emotional... Um, I think what, what, what this particular exploration helps me with is a, a, a bewilderment and a blankness that I have experienced with certain uh, states of seeking that I haven't found a lot of connection in and have been bewildered by. Why is there no connection when somebody is sort of academically curious? So I, I want to see that I understand it. And in order to see that, I'm going to say different things from oh, yes. what you said. Yes. Um, so the thing that is, that, I, um, that is emerging from me is that these circuits are separate, which means that the seeking circuit, is, there, is that the only one that is motivational and not emotional? Sexuality, it also in its sort of purest circuit form, doesn't have so much emotion connected to it. And, um, and care, interestingly enough, which has a lot of warmth connected to it. Uh, and, then, uh, and then also play. So affection is with the care circuit, and then happiness is with the play circuit. But happiness is an emotion. So now I'm confused because I thought you said that the motivational circuits are not emotional. Um, you, can, you can assign uh, happiness, interestingly enough, is an, is an emotion which appears in the left hemisphere. Uh, just a second. Uh, Kirsten, I want to turn off your video because it's very, the movement is very distracting for me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Say that last thing again, I didn't hear. Uh -huh. The seeking circuit is, is basically the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is run by dopamine. The seeking circuit is run by dopamine. The left hemisphere, when we, when we close off the right hemisphere with electromagnets or um, when people ha um, have a split corpus callosum, the left hemisphere is not a relational place. Mm -hmm. It's a place that holds a couple of emotions. It holds the seeking circuit and it holds approach related anger and it holds, um, and it holds happiness. And we have to think about uh, happiness in a particular way to understand it as a left hemisphere emotion. Delight really takes us into the right hemisphere, a sense of delight in another person's existence. We know that person exists. But if you think about the exuberance, the happiness that comes when, like with Tigger from Winnie the Pooh, or just like that, the bounciness mm -hmm. where there's no relationality, somebody's just like, aggressively happy and that you know it's there's it's a broadcast state rather than any kind of interdependent state of uh, of connection it can move into interdependence with the addition of care it can move into interdependence with the addition of delight of awe this okay is a way so in a relational state uh, so I'm, I'm now getting more confused because it sounds like you, initially it sounded like you were making, the significant distinction was between emotional and motivational circuit. Yeah, yeah. And now the distinction that you're making is more about left and right hemisphere. I'm bringing them together, yeah. But then it sounds like all the motivational things are in the left hemisphere and some of the emotional things. So there are no more... There are no motivational circuits in the right hemisphere? The, the right hemisphere, that's not entirely true because care, in a way, okay. is, an emotional, is, an, is a motivational circuit. It, this, it, I think this, it, this circuit information um, explains so much where nonviolent communication sort of gets a little fuzzy, like, is love a feeling? Is love, an, is love a need? You know, 
I feel loving. Where does that come? That kind of essential wondering about uh, different kinds of ways we use language to describe states of being. So um, I, I feel warm. You know, I feel warm towards you. Is that a feeling? Is it a, is it a neurobiological state of connectedness? You know, this, this connects me with a distinction that I make, you know, I don't study neuroscience. Yeah. I have, you know, a very ambivalent relationship with it. It's like, it's okay for as long as it preserves dignity. Yeah. As soon as it seems like it doesn't preserve dignity, ah, it's just reductive thing. Let's get yeah. rid of it. Yes. You know, that, that's my ambivalence. Yes. Um, I am also very conscious that as a lefty, that lefties are more integrated between the hemispheres. Yes. And, um, and that's a significant thing yeah. in my sense of self, understanding that that's so for me. But um, um, the distinction that I'm making may or may not map into what you know about neuroscience. It's, I, I divide needs into two categories. Um, and I don't have words for it. I have only an energetic field. So the, the Leone who doesn't see, I will need to find words. Maybe you can help me find them. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, maybe I would say one, one set is protective needs. Mm. And the other set is moving towards life needs. Mm. And the protective needs include obviously safety. But it also includes respect. It also includes autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and the moving towards life in, in, includes, you know, needs like, you know, anywhere from meaning to community, you know, like I'm talking about large categories. Mm -hmm. um, obviously connection. Um, and... And I'm curious how that distinction maps into the distinction that you're making. Yeah, it maps for me because there's research that shows that some needs words light up the left hemisphere and some needs words light up the right hemisphere. And I'm, I call these, uh, I make this distinction also and I call it instrumental and relational. Okay. Um, so I, I, I started saying something about this to you yesterday, but since mm. the recording didn't happen yesterday, I want to repeat it, which is I am beginning to play with a sense that um, in certain states, not only are we not connected with our needs, mm. we are also, even unconsciously, certain needs are just dead in yeah. the in yeah. certain situations, dead. And, and my, uh, my social analysis is that we live way too much of the time collectively in those states because of what we have created in terms of institutions. Mm. Um, and that frightens me because, um, you know, like nonviolence, Part of what makes it successful as a, as a social movement, not as a personal, individual, interpersonal thing, part of what makes it successful is that it activates the care of another. If that other lives in a state where most of the time care is not part of the internal equation or the circle of care is so enormously limited, that it doesn't apply to most people, which is almost equivalent, then nonviolence is losing its core power. I think we, I, I have to agree with you. I think we live in a very frightening world. And I don't think it was like this even 40, 50 years ago. I think that, that you know, patriarchy has been damaging from the get go, but the damage like all other functions that have started then is is a is an exponential function 
with a very small increment. So for a very long time, it was almost constant. And then, you know, in the last 40, 50 years, all the things that matter have, have turned the hockey stick. You know what I'm talking about, the hockey stick? Yeah. And this is one of them, the extraordinary damage that patriarchy, we, you could say that patriarchy separates left hemisphere from right hemisphere. I believe that's true. Because I, I absolutely do not want to malign the left hemisphere. I just no, no, no. refuse, like staunchly refuse to do it. I mean, when people say, you're in your head, go to your heart, I, I, I find that, that too frightening. Yeah. The, it's the separation between things, the non-integrated state that, that patriarchy creates. Yes, and I love it that you named the limitation of the circle of who, who matters. Yeah. When that, when that circle is so small that it doesn't, um, that it doesn't permit for a, a broader morality to be in place. Yeah. And um, and wanting to bring into this conversation the, this beautiful and fascinating recent research that showed that if you took liberals and conservatives and you asked them social questions, of course, they answered very differently about how uh, the, the answers to the social questions were very different. But if you took the conservatives and you had them imagine themselves into a world that felt safe to them, then they're answers were identical. The wow! This is, this is uh, monumental. It is monumental. It is of monumental interest. Can, I mean, aside from anything, could you send me the link? Uh, yeah. Wow! And I also think that the, this, in that sense, that, that's a nice way to even say that the distinction between liberal and conservative is um, incidental. Yes. Yes. Every liberal can become a conservative yeah. in the right activation. And in fact, yeah. most liberals are conservatives in relation to conservatives it's just that no one calls it that yeah because they're terrified of them yeah yeah and we see it in hungary right now where um there where like even the liberal people right now uh the government has created a fear state um where there's a terrible fear that hungarian society and culture will be destroyed by letting in syrian immigrants by letting in muslims by letting in Muslim immigrants. And, and there's a widespread support in Hungary for this recent passage of this law that makes it a criminal offense to aid a Syrian refugee. It passed well, last week, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it brings me back to one of my favorite little things that Marshall said, mm. which is um, unacknowledged fear looks like aggression. Do you yeah. remember him saying that? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. It reads as aggression. Yeah. And, and so all the... Um, all the... Um, behaviors that people do that are incomprehensible in some ways can be traced to that mm -hmm. and there's a, another thing maybe you can help me with that too which is i find when i or others try to empathize with people maybe not all others mm. that if i can find um, um, moving toward life need uh -huh. to be able to empathize with. Yeah. It's easier to bridge the gap mm -hmm. than, than if the need that I find is one of those protective needs. Yes. Well, so yeah. it's harder to empathize when all you can come up with is a need for safety. Yeah. Um, and I am wondering if 
we can replace that like literally mechanically replace that need with another need with a pair of two needs basic well-being and trust mm. both of which are easier to bring to create tenderness as a response than yes. safety yes they're more relational when 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 you know when you try to empathize with somebody feeling unsafe it's too easy to say but they have no reason to be unsafe right you know there's no everything is safe what are you talking about yeah. whereas um basic well-being and trust don't won't generate that objective arguing with the need mm -hmm. in the way that safety would Mm -hmm. And that objective arguing is what makes it harder to empathize. Yeah. Yeah. This is all very cool. Yeah. It's a, I have a sense of convergence. Between what and what? Between um, the work that I do and the way that I use language and the work that you do and the way that you use language. Yes. Yeah, it's it's kind of fun because I see that you are doing things on a very individual level, which mm -hmm. I'm not saying that critically. I'm just one individual brain. Mm -hmm. And I do think, I think about things in kind of like historical, social political geopolitical big mm -hmm. big frame mm -hmm. and it's kind of like interesting to think of it as making collective changes to brain mm -hmm. because you know i i think conversely of moments um the one that has most stuck with me is the moment when Anwar Sadat flew to Jerusalem and talked to the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. And suddenly, fear of each other on both sides dramatically diminished. Wow. And suddenly, it was possible to talk about peace between Israel and Egypt. But it's an incredibly cold piece. Let's not get all carried away. But something changed the field. Mm. And then people's nervous systems adapted to that very quickly mm -hmm. without having to do trauma release of war mm. to millions of people. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Because yes. You know me. I don't have any hope that we can offer individual trauma relief to enough people fast enough. No, I don't think we can. And, you know, in the other direction, you bring a new ruler to Hungary, to the U.S., and you change people's basic sense of well-being and trust, if I'm going to use those words. Yes. And suddenly they're willing to do things that ordinarily they wouldn't. Right. It, matter, oh. it matters what the person who's the nominal head of the organization or the country or the business or the family does. It matters. Yeah, and, and he himself you know, I'm curious if we have a similar understanding of him. Of Anwar Sadat, of Trump? No, no, Donald Trump. Uh -huh. My sense of him is that he doesn't actually have a sense of self. That there's a hole in the bag that's supposed to contain the sense of self. So everything that comes leaks instantly. And that he has no... Um, in a fundamental sense of well-being or trust in anything. I would agree with you. The, the right hemisphere is the hemisphere that holds the sense of self, 
the felt sense of self, and it holds relational memory. And his incapacity to, uh, one of the characteristics of people that have completely closed the door to the relational self is that they can't, they can't even remember what they said. They can't, it doesn't, there's no real timeline. There's no real time location. Mm. So almost everything that we see in, in this person's behavior comes from the complete disappearance of relationality. So now connect for me, fight, flight, freeze, and left hemisphere. Sure. Um, the, and this is the work of uh, Stephen Porges, who is the man who has done the integrative study of the fight, flight, freeze, um, and also a state that he calls social engagement. So, um, uh, and, and this is another interesting emotional piece that I've been working with. Um, fight, <clears throat> so the nervous system has three states of being. It has a state of being that's social engagement. It's where the heart rate is variable, the facial muscles are engaged, the eyes see human faces with ease, ears tighten to the sound range of human voices. There's an engagement in relationship that comes when people have a sense of this fundamental well-being and trust. Mm -hmm. And when this is so, then there's a, then there's a movement into integration. We were able to take action, which is the, the left hemisphere is our action taker, and it comes from, it's founded in the energy of our deepest needs. So an integrated movement into space. When our system gets alarmed, it moves into fight, flight, it moves into the fight, flight strip of being, activation, elevated heart rate. Um, we lose the fine muscle feed to the face. Eyes don't focus on human faces. Ears don't focus on human voices. We're listening for danger and, and watching for danger instead of being tuned to relationality. So in this experience of agitation, we make an almost complete left shift. Everything moves to strategy. Mm -hmm. When we move into fight flight, the whole system slips into strategy. This is one of the things I love, Mickey, about something you wrote recently. You said, I am letting go, and I have already let go a lot. I am letting go more than I ever have to outcome. Do you remember mm -hmm. writing that? Yeah. This is, a di this is directly speaking to the way in which when we let go of outcome, we move into the relational space. We move out of the seeking circuit. Mm -hmm. When we're in an, an outcome invested place, we want to move into this. We're moving into the seeking circuit because we want that outcome, which takes us out of relationality, which is why for me, it was so profound that you mentioned this movement more than ever before into releasing outcome. Um, uh, hang on a second. I think Kirsten wanted to ask something. Okay. And which is, and I just want to, I, from my perspective, I don't know how it is for you. I'm very happy for Kirsten and Leone yeah, to yeah. participate. Absolutely. Yes, Kirsten, do you have a question? Uh, it's more something I wanted to add on the, the notion that when uh, suddenly something changes the field, um, you were talking about the peace between Egypt and Israel. And uh, currently, I don't know if, if, if you're okay for me adding this, because I'm currently reading a book uh, written by Joanna Macy and uh, Chris Johnstone. And I just found this uh, so very curious and I had a realization kind of, um, because she wrote of an experiment where people were asked to fill out a survey and then they enter, they had smoke come into the room. And when the people were alone, they very quickly acted and went outside, searched for help or anything. But if not, if they were there with other people, filling out this survey, they first looked for what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. And what I got from this is that um, if, so when, when we see other people acting, we act as well. If we don't see other people acting, we don't act. So by individuals acting, um, if, if this crosses a, th a certain threshold, even in a local bubble, then it can emerge very, very quickly. And this can go quickly so exponentially that it, it changes behavior of people um, 
yeah. pretty instantaneous. So um, that was just like like something that clicked for me that I found very very interesting. Mm. That yeah, it speaks, I think, to how essentially social we are. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And and it also reminds me that my growing sense is that in uh, intact indigenous cultures that are very relational, there is also a highly developed sense of individual and individual self-trust and self-autonomy. Mm. That, that the whole structure that posits one against the other is completely flawed. That already is from within the world of separation, in which being with others is at cost to self, mm. and you know, following self is at cost to relationships. Mm. Yeah, um, and I I now forgot what you were saying because I had a, a question to it. Hey, go ahead. I remember where I was, so no worries. Uh, just but I don't remember the question. If oh, you say where we I'll were, go back to where I am. Yeah, sure. So here we are. We have social engagement. Where all where those relational needs? Yeah. What you called them? Uh, something else. Uh, I life, think relational life. relational is a subcategory of what I'm talking life about. Life serving. But, but, um, I, I I don't like that language, but moving towards life. Moving I, I think towards of them. Okay. Because meaning is not necessarily relational, but it is in that category. Hmm. Uh, for me, meaning is profoundly relational. So I think you, you, yeah. for you the word relational expands its meaning. Yeah. And that's fine. We, we are. Yeah. So needs. So in that top swath of being in, in social yeah. engagement, there's a lot of moving towards life. Yeah. Then we get down to fight flight, and there's um, there's this. Ah, um, I know what I wanted to yes. what I wanted to say now, sure. which is. Um, in my own investigation of the spirituality of NBC, what is unique about the spirituality of NBC as compared to other forms of spirituality? For me, I, I think you may have heard this. I call it wanting fully without attachment. Mm. So it's an, it's an integrated state. Yeah. So there's something about saying that, you know, letting go of outcome is, I'm no longer in the seeking circuit doesn't feel true to me. Mm. It's for me, it's an integration of the seeking circuit mm. with care, with, care. Yeah. with um, uh, humility, mm. with other states that mm. allows me to be as fully passionate about what matters to me mm without being in that locked thing of it has to be this way. Mm. So that I was I was just advocating for for integration. Yeah, non malign I, it's kind of like the seeking without an unintegrated seeking circuit is the danger, not the seeking circuit itself. Yes, very true. Uh, very true and quite beautiful or it needs for beauty for me. So let me finish here, because there's something yes. else that I've been exploring with this concept that I think is hugely important and speaks to both of our concern about the Western world. Um, and then the final swath of experience is when people give up hope and they move into immobilization. So that's been traditionally called freeze, but uh, Stephen Poor just calls that swath of experience immobilization, in part because freeze gives you the sense of tonic immobility where immobilization can be a collapsed immobilization, a limp immobilization. And, um, and so there's more complexity in the word immobilization than in the word freeze in a way. So we, ha so we have these three ways of, that our nervous state uh, is in relationship to life, in relationship to others. And so what we see with the conservatives, if we're taking seriously this fear research, is that they are in flight, that they are in the fear response, and they're, they're stuck in a swath of experience which doesn't allow them full expression of their inner being. And then we have... Um, the, the Except when they are in the context of their own community, their own family, their own something, where, where the way... Where, 
it's within the circle of care. And so in that sense, I, I just want to take aside that binary distinction of conservative and liberal. I don't like it. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think that it's a feature of modern living mm -hmm. that many of us, much of the time, live in that, in that, in that swath. Yes. Yes, absolutely. What I want to do is I want to complexify fight flight a little bit. Um, and I've been working with this. Uh, I want to, um, I want to shift it into, uh, to, to add uh, the fear of abandonment, mm -hmm. which, which gets, it's a, there's a whole mammalian circuit that's devoted to the panic that comes when somebody that we love disappears. It's what little baby mammals do when their mother disappears and they start to cry for her. Um, but it's, but it, 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 it car that whole circuit carries our sadness and our grief. And we're ellipsing an entire swath of agitated grief. It's, it doesn't even appear in our English vocabulary. And, and then the closest we can get is abandonment. I feel abandoned. But then that is, to, in nonviolent communication, we're told that that's a phone need, that that's not a true need because it's implying... That a faux some, feeling, you mean? Oh, sorry, feeling. Because we're told that it's a faux feeling because somebody, we're implying that somebody else has done something to us and no one can do anything else. Oh, this is so our, cool. Yes, this is the heart of our, of our intention, I think, for this conversation. And, and so I want to bring in a body of um, reading that I've done that I think you haven't yet uh, from Umberto Maturana. I told you about this book, The Origins of Humanism. Yes, I have it on my reading list, yes. Uh, so um, uh, the briefest thing from there that is relevant to this is it says that mammals have two modes, a mode of love and a mode of dominance and submission. And the mode of love is mostly, um, you know, mothers and their offspring. And the mode of dominance and submission is mostly adults. And that humans have evolved separately into the biology of love, in which a process, a very known biological process called neoteny, which is the extension of childhood or youth. So it is known in biology that. Our features are more similar to baby chimpanzees than to adult chimpanzees, even as adults. So we clearly have extended childhood, but it's more than just how long it takes to mature. It's that we remain in a certain way in childhood our whole life. And specifically, it means that we need love. We can do dominance and submission because but because we hadn't yet lost the, that genetic possibility. And it also probably doesn't make sense to lose it because in certain contexts, it is pro-survival. But it wasn't anymore our dominant way of being. And we remain in need of love, in need of that social affirmation, for our entire life. So being in the mode of dominance and submission makes us sick physiologically. Yeah. And so you can say that part of the malaise, I, I just haven't quite articulated until you say, brought this thing about the fear of abandonment, is that um, we put ourselves into a fight, flight, freeze state through the narratives and the institutions that we have. Uh, in which dominance and submission make sense. But they, it doesn't make our need for love go away. So it gets fed into the fight flight. If that's what you're telling me now. Um, what I'm telling you... That, that fear of abandonment is the need for love coming into it, the agitated state. Except it's not, it's, it's not just humans. I want to expand this a little bit because it's true for the sea, for the sea animals that travel in packs, uh, flocks, fleets, what are, what are sea animals? What are dolphins? Pods. Um, and then, uh, 
and then it's true for elephants. Uh, it's true. It's true for dogs within uh, families. You know that even dogs that aren't physically related to one another, they re become attached to one another. Cats become attached to one another. Yeah, there's a whatever the social grouping is, the mammals in it have the same capacity to, 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 that they have the need for for the for the warmth and for the love. It's it's, it's not just humans. That, that's a speciesism that uh, that hurts my body. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and I'm just going to breathe for a little minute. Yeah. So, indeed, the the need for love is a, is in that swath of uh, of, of agitation, and we don't. Ha and what I wanted to say there is that we have so few words that capture it that even. When we talk about fight, flight, freeze, we're implying that it's anger and fear. We're not even making room for the panic of loss. In our, in our language, it just shows up everywhere, that we ellipse grief as a panic state entirely. The only place it's allowed to show up in our society is down in the freeze swath. You know, I mean, wailing grief uh, and and uh, and expressions of uh, of broken heart that are agitated and loud are so uh, unheard. In, in yeah, I'm once again wondering what it is when we are integrated. You yeah. know, what does it mean to get into a fight flight yeah. swath without losing relationality? Yeah. And it, that's that's what you know. Females do tend and befriend. Tend and befriend is the top one. But it's under top. conditions of immense stress, they still will do it. Yes. Um, and we'd have to look at their physiology to to see if they were actually being knocked out of social engagement. There are physiological changes. I think they're they they've they've learned a an adaptive sort of an adaptive accommodation to, to, to be able to utilize, um, to utilize the, the, the swath of social engagement in part because of the emphasis in our culture and in the West on women doing the emotional labor. I'm talking about uh, animals. Mm. Um, so um, what, from what I read, it's the females um, they can't fight prey, and they can't flee and leave the young behind. So they d that they do something together collectively. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't remember the details, but mm -hmm. it's specifically it it is physiological, um, evolutionary. It's not learned behavior uh, from socialization um, it's it's about care it's it's yeah. exactly when when it's exactly when the care cannot be turned off then even under conditions of immense stress you will neither fight nor flee nor collapse you will do something because the care compels you to yes but even in in animals yeah the the attachment and the original relationship with the mother makes a difference to whether or not those little ones can grow up to tend and befriend if they if they're separated from their mothers and don't have the don't get the attachment uh, relationship in place then they don't know, then they'll grow up and they won't be able to affiliate in order to create these groups. So it's not, it's not purely evolutionary. It, okay. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's like it's evolutionary and epigenetic. Yes, it's built upon actual lived experience of receiving care and of it being in yeah. the relationship. But the neoteny, did I say the word right? Neoteny is, uh, of course, hugely important in humans. That's hugely important because then 
we have this longer childhood where the where the I mean, the human brain doesn't fully myelinate until age 28. So we're being, we're, we're, in, we're integrating others' relationships with us all the way until we're 28. And then as we move in, you know, there's much, the, the social affiliative behavior, you know, is entirely dependent on what we've ah. been able to experience as little ones. So here is unorthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Um. So we are saying, and I believe it's true, that whatever happens, we make meaning of it, and that is what generates the feelings. Whatever happens, we make meaning of it, and that is what generates the feelings. It's not like what happens causes the feelings. No, what happens causes body sensations. But even that, based on the meaning that we make of what happens. Um, um, you, you know, the our, meaning comes, our meaning comes about 14 milliseconds after our body. Our body has a response within 3.03 uh, .03 milliseconds. And I would, I would submit without knowing, I have a lot of hubris in certain areas, <laughs> that there's meaning making that happens even within that. And even meaning making to evaluate danger or not danger uh, i wonder if we're touching on the wonderful teaching story that marshall used where he he said you've been hit hard from behind you're angry you turn around and you see that you've just stopped a child from running their bike under a bus is this kind of the area of consideration that we're in um possibly Mm. Possibly. What um, my understanding is that there's there are only three types of danger that are innate uh, that we recognize in, uh, um, innately, directly, um, without any learning or frame of reference or anything, and mm -hmm. you know that's uh, falling. Uh, you know, um, you know, sudden loud voices and creepy crawly. Mm -hmm. Everything else, we need to learn that it is dangerous. So, for example, if we've been raised in a world where there is no physical violence, and we're hit by a child from behind with a bike, we're we're going to go, "What's wrong?" We're not going to go, "I'm pissed off that I'm being hit," because we've never been hit in violence. So, something violence like this. Is part of the meaning. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. um, and uh, you know. And you know my my personal understanding of of trauma is that it it, it leaves interpretive frames in the brain that that are likely to interpret things like what happened as danger. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's how you see that the same activity generates danger in one person and not in another. Mm -hmm. Even though it is, you know, before we are conscious, it happens unconsciously and quickly, but it's still a layer, a, a layer of interpretation. Yes. Um, I was going somewhere with it. Ah, I know, I know where. And I have a sense that we have conflated that reality with what I, the unorthodox part, which is, I don't think that everything comes just from our needs, that there is a relational field mm. that, you know, however I read the relational field, it will create feelings in me. Mm. Because it's almost like the need lives not in me. It lives between us. As you're speaking, let me check this. I'm, I'm getting an image of um, patriarchy coming down with its narratives and creating, like, it's already a traumatized field that's coming down on us. And it's bringing these narratives of interpretation yeah. that, um, that have so many layers of pain. 
yes, that that is the first part, the the interpretive thing. But um, I, I but the uh, the thing that I was saying about the need, it, I, I, it's a it's a brand new thought, and I don't even. You said unorth. You said so, unorth so to say I'm abandoned, and to, and then to say that's not a feeling. I understand. One part of why it's not a feeling is because it involves an interpretation. But, uh, but we're, we're, it's like we've got multiple layers here. I need a different word besides abandoned, which is something like my nervous system is noticing that somebody who's very dear to me is gone, and it is, and it is an alarm state. Yes, I, I, I understand that. I, I am literally focusing on the word abandoned. Okay. Because when we say it, mm -hmm. I mean, I no longer say it. In other words, my actual deep internal consciousness mm -hmm. has shifted mm -hmm. to where that, it's, it's not like it comes up and I need to translate it. It doesn't come up. Mm -hmm. Humiliated still comes up for me. Humiliation still comes up for me as the actual experience that I am struggling to translate into other words or not but so look, we can stick with abandon that abandoned implies something done to me and there is a way in which it's true i am interpreting it as done to me but once that interpretation is there it is from the outside in. I don't even, I, I don't know how to finish those sentences. I'm, I'm, my words are not conveying what I'm trying to say. Um, I wonder if we're touching a distinction. I mean, it seems that we are touching a distinction between the sharp pain of loss And our nervous systems like being in an alarm state because of the loss. And um, and um, And the implication, so that uh, just tracking with you a little bit, that, that in the word abandoned, there's an implication that someone has done something to you. You've given up the use of this word entirely because you see with such clarity, let me check this, you see with such clarity that nobody's, nobody is intending harm, that the intention for harm, that the intention to leave is not there, that when leaving happens, it's tragic, but not that there's no aspect of intentionality. Yet the language, if we use that language, it retains an implication that someone is intending harm. Am I tracking with you a little bit? <coughs> and yet there is a different aspect, which is that I'm responding to something that is happening in the field between us. Mm. Not just within me. Mm. It's happening in the field between us. And so... It makes sense to look for a word that acknowledges the in between us, not just the within me. Mm. Mm. And the word abandon does that. It does that at a high cost mm -hmm. of bringing in that whole interpretive frame. But mm. if you get rid of the word abandon, then I can see why you would be at a loss to find a word because there's a whole dimension. It's like we need to invent new words. Exactly, exactly. We need to invent new words for this swath of experience, of, uh, but also wanting to come back to something you hinted at, but we didn't fully blossom out into, which is that grief, when you look at grief in an integrated indigenous um, society, what you see is grieving in community. Mm -hmm. You see that shared mourning. You see people yelling and holding each other and shaking together. You, you know, something we don't get to do. Yeah. And that's so integrated. It's not, it's not the fight or flight anymore. 
Yeah. It's a social engagement because we're doing it together. It happens sometimes in NBC workshops. Yeah. That somebody gets into deep mourning and then it becomes a collective experience. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And then there, of course, the grief. I can't remember ever how to say the person's name, Maldome Same or something, does grief workshops to teach about indigenous African, I don't know if the word indigenous works with Africa, um, to teach these uh, community grief rituals so that people can begin to experience it. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it helps me understand sometimes when I work with individuals to get in touch with grief, I instinctively develop this of where I ask them to make sound. Mm. And then if they can't make sound, I make it for them. Mm. And that helps. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is exactly there in that social engagement relational field. Yeah, exactly there. Interestingly enough, it's really helpful with fear too. If somebody's holding fear and rage and we do, you know, we do the sounds with them, it'll often move stuff that's deeply stuck. Mm. So there's something, something with all of these emotions that when we get to move it into the community and accompany one another, something very different happens. And, and yet the way that we have trained ourselves to do empathy almost it's coded with a northern cold uh, um, approach yep i've had uh, certification candidates tell me that they were told that they were feeling too much with the person that they were giving empathy for that they were displaying too much emotion themselves and that they needed to be back away from the emotion wow yeah. And because I come from one of those cultures, mm. um, it's kind of a, it straddles. It's mm. in, in some respects, it's a global North culture. And in some respects, it's totally not. Mm. Um, when people give me empathy in that kind of cold way, it just doesn't register. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 you're saying the right words, but where are you? What's in your heart? Mm. Yeah. And I remember Marshall very, very, very intensely saying again and again and again, you don't feel anything. You're empty. Mm. And I read research about empathy years ago that suggests that what we do when we offer empathy is really rapidly go back and forth between focusing on the other person and focusing on ourselves. Mm. Like, Many times a second. Mm. There's an accompaniment. Yeah. 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 I, I always have the sense that if, uh, that if I'm tearing up or if I can feel it in my body, then I'm actually in my right hemisphere instead of just, that I'm actually in an integrated space instead of, uh, instead of shifted out of my body into something clinical. Yeah. yeah. So th this is um, about the time that we have scheduled, and um, I, I wanted to just open it up to see if Leone or Kirsten wanted to say or ask anything and then maybe move towards closing. Wonderful. How was that? How, how was this for you? For me? Uh, it was uh, very satisfying. Cool. Yeah. Okay. How was it for you? very rich and it's kind of like are you kidding we're done no <laughs> yeah uh kirsten leone anything any questions or comments mm, comments maybe i also found it very rich and very interesting just i took so many notes because uh there were so many things i found so interesting um yeah we uh, talked a lot about um, this feed, this uh, area of pseudo feelings they're called in NVC language, for example, abandoned. But yeah. there are other ones too, probably. That and 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 sometimes people do have this feeling. But I do feel this way, and so I I thought this is just just a very very interesting topic, and maybe we really do need um, 
new vocabulary. And also in the end, this uh, cold empathy really registered with me uh, because, yeah, I, I noticed that many people, that, that oftentimes it's said to be only pure if, if you're not involved in a way, not displaying any emotion yourself, but very calm and clinical, as you said. And yeah, for me, it's on the, on the one hand, I'm not very good at doing this kind of empathy. I usually get involved in a way. Not, not, not like I'm affected, it doesn't, but I do feel something. Um, and um, yes. yeah, and it doesn't register sometimes with me if people do it very cold, but mm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, just before you go, Leonie, I, I, Kirsten, what you just said reminded me that it's the same as morality, that, you know, the Kantian morality basically says, if you have feelings, you are not actually taking moral action. Moral action is moral only when you do it out of duty. Mm -hmm. It's a direct quote that I, yeah. I have somewhere. Exactly the, the, those kinds of words. Yeah, thank you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you want to add to Kirsten? Uh, yeah, appreciation to hear what was yeah. happening to you, Kirsten. Very grateful to know. And Leonie, anything you want to? Um, just want to express gratitude and, and also to say that the part that I'm thinking about is that idea of the space in between. Mm -hmm. And if it has to do with kind of like those unsaid agreements that come in relationships. Yeah. So like your mother is your mother and there's the kind of mar marketed idea of what a mother is, but there's also <laughs> some kind of understanding within your body of what a mother should be. And is it like the breaking of that agreement when someone, when, say for example, if she is to leave you, um, I'm just, I'm just finding myself really curious about that piece. So just wanted to express gratitude and um, yeah, this was really rich for me. Thank you. Thank you, Leonie. Um, yeah. If, if I may add another thing that was also very interesting for me. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation about uh, liberals and conservatives and actually that um, conservatives uh, answered the same way as liberals did when um, when they imagined a safe environment. There was, yeah, so interesting just that mm -hmm. this distinction between liberals and conservatives is not really fitting because I've wondered all this time, also what what how can we help so-called conservatives become more liberal in a way? <laughs> and... Be, be open to new ideas and changing things and yeah, opening up in a way. Yeah. I like, I like the idea of just letting go of those distinctions and yeah. talk about, you know, people's beliefs when they are afraid and people's beliefs when they're not. And what are the conditions that make people more or less afraid? And that changes it from ideological to practical. Mm -hmm. It does. It's a lovely shift. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, anything you want to say before we close? Mm. Or here? Just absolute love to be in the world with you, Mickey. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It, um, it makes it easier for me on certain days to walk through the world to remember our connection and the warmth that you bring to the world in general and to me in particular. Mm, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I hope I could interest you down the line in, in doing something like this again. Always. All right. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye for now. Bye-bye.